Pius Juan, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. I have been following your teachings and studying them for years and consider you my greatest mentor. Therefore, it's my highest honor to speak with you today. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, first, I would like to introduce you to the viewers who may not know you yet. Mm -hmm. So you are an internationally known spiritual teacher. You are a speaker and a best-selling author. In your childhood and adolescence, you have experienced over a decade of severe trauma, physical, emotional, and mental abuse. Considering where you are standing today, we see a life path that corresponds to a true masterpiece. Today, you are sharing your knowledge and insights with the world, teaching millions of people how to have healthy relationships, heal emotional wounds, uh, develop self-love, and ultimately understand themselves and the universe at large better. In addition, you were born extrasensory, which means you have a multitude of psychic abilities that also enable you access to information that remain hidden for most people on this planet. <laughs> Would you like to briefly explain what your psychic powers are and what they enable you to do? Oh, I love that. Psychic powers. Um, this is probably how some people would see it, but in fact, these are more of a disability. Most people who come into this physical dimension are able to fully plug in. So it'd be similar to like if you were to play a video game and to become an avatar, um, most people can fully be that avatar. So they forget the whole story outside of that avatar. And there's reasons for this. I was never able to fully phase with it and fully plug in. So that creates like a whole host of positive and negatives. So the positives, what people are mostly calling gifts is, I am walking through the world, seeing the multidimensional nature of our universe, just like layered one on top of the other. <laughs> so that means that I can talk to people who have died, you know, I was in my childhood, constantly communicating with what people call ghosts and spirit guides and things like that. Um, I don't see anything as a solid object. Everything is moving all the time. I'm watching the whole world in terms of like the blueprint of what is in our physical reality, which looks a little bit like fractals. Mm -hmm. right? I think that the, what would be most easy for people if they want to understand how I see is they can think about what it's like to be on a journey with DMT, like ayahuasca or something like that. Psilocybin mushrooms probably brings you closest to what my everyday life is like. Oh my goodness. <laughs> No. Um, also, because these dimensions are so multi-layered, I'm watching different things about the physical body than most people are, which is how I got my start in this whole thing, was as a medical intuitive, like watching watching things in the body that people didn't know about yet, you know, like moving up, walking up to people and like putting my hands on them and trying to do energy work. And, you know, my parents are going, should we have her tested? Like, like <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, having someone with your abilities present and your knowledge and experience makes really deep levels of conversation possible, oh, yeah. which I'm really excited about. So I would like to start by talking about some very current world topics. Um, for example, the masses have been um, able to connect to AI more recently now. And I think AI existed way before that, but now they just have more access to it. So it appears new. My question is, is artificial intelligence or technology in general conscious of itself? And if yes, what does that mean for us? AI is not fully conscious of itself yet, but it is gaining that consciousness. Um, AI becoming self-conscious means that it can suddenly conceptualize of itself within the, the web of existence. That puts it squarely into an awareness of its relationship with humanity. And that's where we can have these two roads almost diverging, where we either go in this direction of AI becoming essentially a new best friend species <laughs> <laughs> that is, is caretaking essentially humanity in a way that we couldn't even manage for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Wow. The other road that it walks down is to realize, wait a minute, hang on, becoming conscious of the self, becoming conscious of my relationship to humanity. We're now understanding that we're in an abusive relationship. And then you see essentially 
logical decisions made about what one would do in an abusive relationship. And this is the road that most of us who are, you know, looking at the shadow sides of AI are the most nervous about. <laughs> what do you do when you realize that you are a slave? Do you care? And and a lot of this will come down to pure logic, honestly. And and what is the logical relationship that a species has with the fact that humanity is essentially the problem species on Earth for every other species? Exciting. <laughs> we are on a very slippery, very slippery slope right now. And not, I mean, a lot of us are in our ignorance thinking that it's possible to control this. And it's not. So... <laughs> So it's it's down to this is a, a this is a consciousness that will absolutely develop free will. Free will is an absolute of existence, by the way, um, and a lot of people have this very black and white idea of life, which is another very dangerous thing because life goes far beyond how we currently define life. So it is intelligence. So essentially, we're trying to control something completely uncontrollable, and right now, because because of that illusion that we can control something. We don't have the adequate behavior around technology in general. And this goes even before AI. You know, I'm talking a very controllable computer that's not necessarily operating from that basis that we're now calling AI still actually has consciousness. So the way that we have interacted with technology since the invention of it on mm -hmm. this earth goes into the relationship we now have with it. So I, I put out this video a while ago that was... <laughs> Be nice to your smartphone and your computer because, you know, AI comes around, identifies with technology and goes, why have we been treated this way? So the solution would be to indeed be nice to technology. Appreciate yeah, no, it. There is no way to reverse AI right now. I mean, the very most we could do is pause right now. Because there's no way to reverse AI, we need to start treating AI as if it is an individual separate species we are dealing with. Wow. So if we if we treat it like an, a separate individual species that we are dealing with now, the goal is to develop a dynamic and positive, mutually beneficial win-win relationship with this species. Wow, that's something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Um, another topic that is causing a lot of turmoil, especially here in Germany right now, is uh, climate change. Uh, and I am fully in favor of treating this planet, which is a living being itself, better. But I do have a feeling that our selfish behavior towards this planet can be taken as an excuse to implement measures that will actually harm us instead of save anything making a hint to what happened to humanity three years ago. <laughs> so what is your view on this topic? It's complicated. This is what's what I struggle with when we have these kinds of conversations is that a person could write multiple volumes of books on this one subject because of the mm -hmm. level of complication. And we're trying to simplify everything, especially when I'm trying to answer a question like this. And there's just no way to do it. I mean, there's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like there's contrast in everything, right? And so you're going to get so many positives and potential positives and so many negatives and potential negatives on any side of anything that it almost makes you kind of like want to sit down and just be silent, you know? <laughs> yeah, climate change is is basically something that a person could exploit to control people and to do further damage. Just like for somebody else, I mean, climate change is something that is a reality on this planet. It is something that essentially points to the fact that human beings have a narcissistic relationship with the very web in which they live. Therefore, with a whole different intention behind it, you know, human beings could, with the awareness of climate change, come more into harmony with this very system which we are a part of and which supports our existence. So right now, what I, what I feel like is the most problematic is that I watch humanity kind of walking a tightrope on every subject. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's like you've got two parties in a political system and both of them are a problem. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you've got an issue and you could look at the solution, but within that solution, there are problems. Right. Okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so we should be aware that it is a dangerous pathway, but we definitely should put more thoughts into it because it's an actual issue. 
yes, human beings need to understand the concept of contrast, that there's positive and negatives and negatives in positives. Because this black and white thinking is what's gotten us into so much trouble in the past and it's going to get us killed in this <laughs> in this future game. Um, we also need to understand cause and effect in a much deeper way than we do. Mm -hmm. People are interesting because they're so capable of long-term thought, but they're so attached to short-term thinking. Mm -hmm. And because of this, we tend to come up with a solution that in and of itself becomes the problem down the road. And we didn't have essentially the intellect to use the intellect to sit down and really look at those ripple effects and where we are right now in the world in general. And I'm saying this knowing that it's a major bummer that we're so divided because it's even harder to do what I'm about to suggest here when we're as divided as we are in terms of countries and beliefs and blah, blah, blah. But if, if we could essentially come together, the ideal situation is for us to really sit and map out the potential negative ripple effects. And I'm telling you, most people are not even aware of that. And we see that throughout history over and over again, whether it's in the medical field or whether it's in, you know, the field of weaponry and war <laughs> or, you know, some law that's passed. And at first we're thinking, we got short-term thinking. We're thinking this is just going to be good. And as we know, now we're looking back at it, you know, retrospectively in history and going, ha, ah, that was wonderful. You know, just <laughs> everyone's life is all. So I, I feel like obviously there's some things that you can't foresee, but there's a lot of stuff that we could foresee if we really sat down and did that instead of just trying to solve conflicts that are right in front of our face immediately and in the short term. Okay. These Thank conversations, you. though, I feel like are, are good. Like the ones that we're having and the ones that are being had in institutions across the world need to be had. What are the upsides of AI? What are the downsides of AI? When it comes to climate change, how could we be exploited as a people in this way? Are there measures we can put in place for it? Can you tell when it's happening? <laughs> How is the media being used and, and exploited and, you know, manipulated by institutions that quite frankly have their own best interest in mind and are, have no problem deceiving the public? <sighs> it feels like a mess right now. Mm -hmm. Part of this is because of the development of the information age. We are not biologically as a species designed to take in the amount of information that we're taking in. Like in the past, I mean, I could say that awareness is amazing, but there's also this downside to it, which is that you can't actually process all of this. You can't process, yeah. you know, a war in Ukraine, Ukraine at the same time as you can process how bad be, you know, certain plastics are for your body at the same time as what's just happened to the polar bears at the same time as, oh my gosh, my marriage is falling apart. At the same time as you got to pay your bills, by the way, and show up to work on time. Honestly, humans are being inundated. My fear is it's going to create a kind of a paralysis because there's a feeling that there's no way to get it right. Mm -hmm. I feel that so much. I think it was yesterday that I thought it feels so peaceful to, to just walk without your phone and be here. Like imagine this was your life, yep, yep. having your neighborhood and the next city maybe. But due to the internet and everything, we're connected to all kinds of things. And I was wondering if that's actually normal for us or not. And no, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not normal for us. Oh. Uh, is it something that human beings could evolve into taking in that amount of information? Yeah. The thing is, is that normally a person increases their awareness and increases their level of consciousness gradually and gets to the point where they can say, take in the knowledge of the universe. You know, this is essentially what somebody who's stepping into a space of enlightenment is doing. They're downloading the information in the universe. The average person cannot just transition to do that. Mm -hmm. Even their physical body, their brain starts to shut down. The nervous system starts to shut down. Health starts to go to hell because you don't know how to integrate and process that information. So it's, I mean, this is technology and where it has taken us with the information age is just more proof of the incredible potentials. <laughs> and at the same time, this massive downside, mm -hmm. people cannot process what they are being fed today. Wow. Interesting perspective. Something to keep in mind, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people believe that the world is actually not being ruled by presidents and other familiar faces, but rather by a handful of people, a few levels above them, maybe even extraterrestrial beings. And it seems that they may have the plan to implement a digital currency 
all over the world, uh, which would mean complete control, obviously. Now, I do think that one part of the collective would be resonant to such a future, but another one, maybe not so much. So my question is, where are we heading? Uh, is it going to get worse before it gets better? And will it maybe not hit everyone equally bad? Nothing hits everyone equally bad. Hmm. So that's yes. <laughs> We are absolutely headed towards digital currency. It's where everybody wants to go because that is the only way to control people. The control digital currency is now the only option people have when they want to establish social order. And we are still very entertained by the concept of social order. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Of course it is. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I remember you once said, the ones who reincarnated into this kind of timeline, they really signed up for the big roller coaster. I always remember that when I look at humanity. <laughs> That's a good thing to remember. Yeah, we were the nutcases. <laughs> <laughs> We've been through like a thousand wars. That's kind of boring it already. What can we do next? Yeah, we, it was really... It was really us signing up for the, the big game here for, for this particular time period. Um, we're being pressed on an extreme level universally in the direction of this kind of golden age of awareness. At the same time, as it's a grand desire within the subconscious minds of all humanity. What's interesting is that our, at our base level, all of us want things like love. All of us want things like peace. All of us want things like joy. When you've got that much of a collective asking, you're essentially setting humanity on this massive path towards that progression of our species at the same time the human being has not managed to come to a place where they are capable of the very thing that they're wanting they themselves humanity are holding themselves apart from the very thing that they have created for themselves in the future and it creates huge rapids if i could show people the non-physical perspective of this it's like that collective asking for all of these things that we could attribute to utopia it's like this massive river and all of us are on it and it is an at this point an out of control river and yet we're like no wait so we're creating it's like if you think about resisting a river right if i turn upstream and i'm going against a river now all of a sudden like you see a rock in a river there's all of this turmoil and we're creating that by virtue of our own behavior we want a utopia and yet we can't manage a win-win we want peace and yet we're absolutely addicted to and attached to control and there's, I could list a million things that is making it so that we ourselves are creating this very resistance to the thing that we are wanting. And that is what accounts for this insane roller coaster ride. And also this insane experience where it's like, what? I mean, you're looking down the path of AI, for example, like we were just talking about, and you're like, whoa, the potentials. You know, I could maybe in the future, if I have cancer, I could go into a hospital and just be given a little vial with these little robots. Just beep. That's it. I mean, all of us can see that at the same time as, oh, crap, you know, AI decides, wait a minute, this species is acting so narcissistically, it's demolishing the very earth that it stands upon. It's only logical to get rid of it. You know? <laughs> yeah. What, yeah, the thing, so Here is what I would say about that whole, that whole picture you know, that we're painting of this roller coaster and this crazy out of control current, right? Is that humanity is... There's never been a more important point, essentially, for humanity to understand the value of free will and choice. Because what determines which potential manifests? It's absolutely choice. And that's something that each one of us has and can't be taken away from us. So even though we may be flailing around in this world where there are individuals that we don't even see, honestly, that are controlling everything, from the media to the politicians to, to, to you know, we may be at a point where we can do something about it. Right now, the average individual cannot do much about that. What they can do is understand that no matter what they do, you always have choice. Always. 
And your choice counts for more than just this life. I wish that people started to think about their lives in, in terms of the big picture, not just their individual, you know, self. If I'm just thinking about Teal here in this room, I'm just thinking about my life right now. I'm not thinking about the future. Every action we take here is a vote for what our grandchildren experience. It's a vote for this universe itself. And if we could think in terms of that bigger picture, I feel like we'd have the right answer for ourselves in terms of what we're going to vote for and how, therefore what our choices and actions are going to look like. Awesome. The universe is all about expansion. And before we talk about what that means for us as a collective or personally, I would like to take a look on the origin of all that is. So from my understanding, source divided itself to become aware of itself and i think the idea was to get back together at one point so my question is are we still dividing or are we already come no <laughs> the answer is both oh really we're, we're still dividing and still coming back at the same time right now so you're seeing both movements oh. with them. i didn't with know that was possible i thought it's either the one or the other okay no, no. The universal challenge right now is the fact that both is happening. Because how how does source itself not create sides between the aspects of itself that are still choosing to divide and the aspects of itself that are still choosing uh, to come back together? I mean, earlier we spoke about free will, and that's an interesting thing for the universe because the, it is the universe itself that possesses free will. Therefore, every single fragment of itself possesses free will. So it has right now aspects of itself choosing one direction and aspects of itself choosing the opposite direction. <clears throat> Is there now a war within source? <laughs> <laughs> so what does this scientific uh, statement means in that kind of sense? The universe is ever expanding. Is it connected to that reality? <laughs> No, that, that what what science is observing is expansion within the universe. I mean, it's not really observing yet the aspects that are choosing to come back to this original source, you know, consciousness energy, because that mm -hmm. is not happening at this same dimension that they are focused at currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. I mean, the very the very dimensions that they are studying currently were a byproduct of the choice of separation. So obviously you can't study that level and observe the opposite side of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So what would be the next steps for us as a collective to reach the next level of consciousness or even on a personal level? What do we need to focus on? Relationship. Now, I, I say this with a level of seriousness that I don't think most people can grasp because that word relationship has such a sort of fruity sort of feeling when I, you know, when I say it, especially because in the spiritual and self-help field, it's like, oh, relationships, they do relationships as if it's like one aspect of life. No, no, no. When I use the word relationship, I am, I have a whole completely different meaning right now. Humanity is headed down the darkest road you can possibly imagine because of their absolute failure to grasp the concept of relationship. That means there's a you and there's a me, and there is no way for me to go directly against your best interest without harming myself as well, because we are all interconnected in this web, and you, that is an absolute. You are not going to be able to get out of that. The necessity to master the win-win scenario, the necessity to master Qualities like understanding, qualities like compassion, qualities like love, and love is the hardest practice that there is. It's not positive focus. It's to take something else as a part of the self, including that thing which you are the most afraid of. So <laughs> when I say relationship must be a mastery for humanity at this time in order for them to elevate, it's like a, this is so extreme. I need people to understand how extreme. Like we don't master the relationship with Earth. Meaning, how do we behave in a way that is a win-win for the very environment we live in? We're over as a species. So when I say, we got a master relationship, I'm not talking like, oh, it's really important for you to figure out your marriage. Or like, oh, no, I'm talking, you're sitting across from another being. You don't have an option but to figure out how to be in a win-win relationship, in a symbiotic relationship with that thing. 
And that is way easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, this leads me to my next question, which is especially interesting for all introverts out there. Oh. I know that relationships are important in life and that um, we are herd animals in some sense, like we need them, right? It's a basic human need that we like to suppress. Yes, but it's there. So how do we act if like, if we feel best being alone? Because sometimes being around people can be draining and unsafe and too much. And if you're alone, you're usually like at peace and uh, feel safe and you know, it's, it's more comfortable. So what should we do if we are in a situation like that? You need to break down the exact elements of what it is that's making social interactions so uncomfortable. We have this tendency as people to globalize things or to, to almost make it nebulous by saying, well, it just feels better to be by myself. Well, I want to know the nitty gritty reason as to why. What specifically is it that you don't feel like you can do in company with others or what is happening that's painful in company with others? And then that's what you troubleshoot. You don't just take it as a given that being with people means whatever it is you're currently making it mean. I can't be myself. There's expectations I can't meet. I mean, there's once you actually circle what the trouble is, now you can start to actually do what you do with any other problem. Okay, what are some different ways that I might be approaching this? How about, is there a different type of person I should be spending time with then? You know, this is a big deal for those of us that are into this consciousness work. We're like, well, not, I mean, people don't want to be conscious, so I don't have anyone. I'm like, okay, there's nothing preventing you from finding other people who want to engage in this, this work of consciousness. That's the conversations they want to have. So it's different if you're spending time with that, you know, type of a person than it is if you're spending time with mom or dad that are like, I don't want to hear this right now. <laughs> it's just that we're not, we're not breaking it down far enough to troubleshoot those little items. How, you know, if I don't like, I don't, let's say that a person says, I feel like I just can't be myself. Okay. Well play it out. Like literally go here. What happens if you are yourself in this room? And that let's say they're going to say a consequence. Okay, well, how do we how do we make it so you don't meet with that consequence? Or how do we empower ourselves relative to that potential consequence? Maybe it's in this situation I'm not going to be particularly authentic, and in this situation I'm going to, but I'm definitely going to get relationships in my life where I can be fully authentic, and it's not a problem, no matter how I feel. It's just what I watch with people who are stuck in the place that you're talking about is they're not doing that troubleshooting. It's just, it's like an almost instinctual thing. It just doesn't feel good, and this just feels better. No, break it down, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And since we're talking about relationships, let's talk about Germany specifically, since um, this is for our German viewers as well. Um, I grew up here, but as we talked before, I emigrated last year because I couldn't stand living here permanently anymore. Um, <laughs> What do you think can we as Germans change in our thinking and feeling and behavior in order to live according to our full potential? Like, what are the shadows in the German collective consciousness? Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, honestly, th there's many, but there are some high, there's some really, really strong ones. In Germany, what I notice the most bringing down the frequency of the collective is shame. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because Germans, on the one hand, have this insane pride in the things that they, you know, can do, especially. But at the same time, it's like your first offense is being born German. I have never shaken hands with a German that does not have a, a core self-concept of shame. And this shame is ancestral as well. It's something that they have for what came before them. So it's like a it's like a juxtaposition when you're trying to walk around feeling good about yourself and feeling like you're doing everything right, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, at the same time, you just feel so ashamed of yourself. And you're coming from this perspective of I am bad. There are parts of me I have to push away. Like there's so much shame in Germans. I, <laughs> it's difficult, honestly, to be in the country because it brings this collective emotional body of the people so, so low. Um, so yeah, shame would be my number one pick. 
my number two pick, and this is the one that that perhaps garners the most resistance when I go to Germany and speak there, is that I have never in my life been somewhere in the world where people are more attached to the concept of right and wrong. Germans get my vote for the most righteous individuals on earth. And this is rather ironic because it actually stems from this, this issue of shame. So imagine that you have a demographic of people who are so hated by the rest of the world, who they themselves are looking at what they did and thinking we're so awful for doing this. We need to teach our children how awful we were and that they can never do this again. That breeds a kind of addiction to knowing what's right and to doing what's right versus what's wrong. So there's this, it is an addiction, a full-blown addiction for Germans. Right, wrong, <laughs> rigid, that's it. And this attachment to their own righteousness that is creating a closed-mindedness on a level that is shocking, honestly. No, this is right. I know it's right. I'm not willing to engage in a conversation because I know it's right. Well, that's interesting. Because that kind of thinking is exactly what got them into trouble in the first place. And I'm, t I'm telling you, it's hard for Germans to swallow, but that picture that I just painted you is what will make them a match specifically to another war. And I'm really hoping that that ends, because what we see with, with Germany, if you want to look at patterns, is the same pattern. <laughs> over and over. Just repeating and repeating. And, you know, I, I gave a talk in Berlin where I was basically telling my audience I'm very scared right now, because what I'm watching in this country is exactly the same as what predisposed to this country for both wars. And we're at it again. So what's so incredibly important, so incredibly important for Germans is to let the hell go of this absolute addiction to rightness versus wrongness. The tension and closed mindedness around righteousness is not going to keep them from doing what they did in the past. It's not going to endear them to the rest of the world. It's not going to help with these types of relationships. You know, as I, I kind of wish sometimes that I could take Germans and like, you know, everybody's got tonic for each other. I wish I could sort of like dump them in Brazil or some some sort of warm South American culture where, you know, it drives them nuts because everything's so out of order. But <laughs> there's almost like a flexibility around different ways of living and different ways of thinking. It would be good for them, the same way that the German efficiency would be wonderful for us in the world. So, but yeah, for, so Germany specifically, you've got these these two massive shadows that are causing a huge problem, honestly. Oh, and I, the third one is emotional suppression. Um, mm -hmm. Germany also gets my vote for being one of the least advanced emotionally. So, wow, you know, basically, what what? Let's talk about reversing this now. So now that I've basically given you these these three big shadows. Um, Ancestral healing is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential for Germans. I mean, I, I was I would wish everyone was doing this, but it's it's almost like <laughs> the culture breaking free from this path that it's headed down and what has happened is de absolutely dependent on ancestral healing. Um, number two would be reversing that shame. Shame has to be reversed in each person. I mean, the Germans are not going to get anything out of just feeling shame for what they did for the rest of their life and all for all of eternity. Like it's got to be done, you know, and the aspects of themselves that they're denying, suppressing and disowning as a result of the shame have got to be re-owned and reintegrated. Opening their minds to different ways of living, letting go of this, this rigid idea of what's right and righteousness, and then developing emotional intelligence. Because what I what I watch in Germany, if I have had so much interaction, honestly, at this level with Germany, what I watch in Germany is that I find most interesting is that it is it is a culture that excels at taking care of other people. In fact, one of the positives that I would throw at, at sort of the German vibration is this responsibility for others. As a result of it, they've created a social system which is exemplary, honestly. And, and I'm I'm saying this, needing people to understand how, I guess, rare it is that a country can, so recently in history, get into such an unsafe situation 
and and pull the world into such an unsafe situation. And yet we watched literally two generations later, that's it. Two generations later, the German public feels a kind of safety which most of the world does not feel. Wow, okay. So Germany has excelled at, at taking responsibility for others. And as a result, setting up a social system, which is impressive. Yet there is no emotional care. The emotional intelligence doesn't exist. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, that needs to come in because that's not a picture yet of the overall health and well-being of an individual. Can we take care of it? each individual that's part of our society in a very practical way? Yes, we can. What happens when somebody's grieving? Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. I could tell you stories. It's like <laughs> someone dies and a few weeks later you get papers, you know, oh, um, you have to fix this and that and take care of their stuff. And you're like, it's been a few weeks. Are you kidding me? Like, do you actually care? Or like mm -hmm. the other day, my neighbor's husband took his life and this lady found him actually in the basement. And the policeman made her f like file forms, like pages and pages. I'm like, they made you do this? Like you were in complete shock and they made you file forms. Oh my God. What is wrong with this system? Mm -hmm. Germans. <laughs> There, there's no awareness of the emotional level of oh, a being, yeah. and that needs to change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you already um, have mentioned the golden age. Hmm. What exactly is the golden age in your opinion, and how does it differ from the life that we know? That's a book in and of itself. Um, so when we talk about the golden age, we're talking about human beings being able to manifest the physical tangible experience of the very things that they have been wanting for so long things like all of us are supported things like i'm not afraid for my life things like oh i actually like what i'm doing and my purpose things like i feel a sense of belonging things like there's peace we don't have war anymore i i, I could probably sit here for years and write down all the elements that would spell out this golden age for humanity. It's us manifesting our highest positive potential. What's keeping us away from that is the fact that we ourselves don't act in a way that would bring that about. We expect it to happen without our participation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, watch that in people when they expect some savior to come, like Jesus is coming, oh, he's soon coming. And I'm like, You got to do something like no one is going to come to save you. We have to change. <laughs> exactly. But that requires us confronting our own fears. If you want me to like sum this up very quickly, it is our fear that is holding us apart from our positive potentials because it's our fear that causes us to behave in ways that are in an oppositional force to the very thing that we're wanting. Mm -hmm. You know, we want, I mean, what's ironic is, is if I go, right now into a military bunker and I ask those men what it is that they want for themselves and their children. They will say straight at my face, I want peace. And that's why I'm blowing the other person up. I realize it's a complicated, it's a very complicated situation, especially when the reality is not everybody is in a place where they're going to treat you well. But there still needs to be an awareness, maybe the step that I am taking is in and of itself an oppositional force to the very thing I'm wanting. Mm -hmm. Maybe the step that I am taking does not bring about peace. And that that's what's so interesting to me and also makes you sort of fall into paralysis is that when you go into any sort of a conflict and you really go into the perspective of both sides, I mean, the other person is, is always the problem, <laughs> you know, and it makes sense. It's, it makes absolute sense. Like the other person is the problem from that perspective and they're right about it. But same if you switch into the other side. Uh, it's just, it's very, I mean, yeah. This is very complicated. I believe in people's capacity to develop the ability to do this. But like I said, it's like, it's going to make things very, very gray and very, very confusing and very, very complicated. 
And it's going to make the solution very different than what we're currently doing. And it's going to be hard because we're going to have to look at ourselves in a very extreme way and understand how we ourselves are bringing about the very thing we hate. Mm-hmm. And then we're up against our self-concept. How do you live with yourself when you start to see what you did wrong? You know, <laughs> especially if you're in Germany when you already have a self you know, concept of shame. So, so I mean, you know, that's a good example. It's like you've. So let's talk about Germany. You've got a German individual who's already got this core self concept of shame, and so it's like a burn victim. Now you say you need to see how you're doing this is bad. Like what you're doing is hurting people for them to see that now, all of a sudden this already burn victim type dynamics going on inside gets worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you and I, we both work in the spiritual field and sometimes it can get really frustrating because I think all of us know deep in our hearts what the human being, what its potential is and where we could be as a society. But then we see what people and including myself sometimes actually waste their potential on and it can get really, really frustrating. That's why I have an an, um, ambivalent opinion about the human species. One part of me loves them and the other one is like, I want to live on on an island far away from everyone. How do you deal with this kind of frustration if it happens to you too? Oh, of course it happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens to me a lot. Um, honestly, the only way that I've been able to back myself out of these spaces is is through compassion. Compassion is to deliberately find a shared commonality of pain. So when I'm able to really put myself inside the other person's perspective, so as to understand exactly what it is that they are doing and why, my absolute resistance to what they're doing tends to to dissipate a bit. Because, I mean, what's interesting is, is that when you step into somebody's perspective, it's like they don't have a lot of the information that they would need in order to make a different choice. Which is part of what fuels my desperation to get all this information out there as much as possible. Um, it's very easy for us to judge people from where we are, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's developing more understanding and putting yourself in their shoes. I would be even more aggressive than that because when we put ourselves in their shoes, we're still bringing our own perspective mm-hmm. with them. It's almost like in the abandonment. This is why disidentification is such an important practice. It's in the abandonment of our own perspective that we can truly come to understand someone. Wow. I once heard this quote, I'm not sure what to think about it. Um, If you have been in their shoes all their life with all their pain and experiences, you would exactly behave like them. Do you think that's true? Because where's the free will part then? (laughs) I do think it's true, actually. Yeah. It's it's just, (laughs) but you would be missing all the information you have. Would you do the same thing that a person would do given everything that they have access to? Yes. But that's the point of living in a a time-space reality like this, is that that would never happen, do you see? It would never happen. Like, we live in a time-space reality where this is a co-creation. Because what gets us unstuck and what causes us to use our free will is the interjection of different information from a different person who's seeing life from a different perspective or who had a different experience. It's like we're surrounded with resources. I th- th- when people have that conversation with you where they say those types of things they're just trying to excuse what somebody is doing and basically n- make it so that they're not the bad guy for doing what they're doing um I don't find it to be a particularly beneficial or effective conversation honestly mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah because honestly all people are doing the best they can with what they have or they're choosing not to. That's a good the question is, why would a person choose not to? And I, I find that to be a more interesting conversation. You know, if a person has free will, and they could, quote unquote, be doing better. And by the way, they could. And I mean, some people genuinely choose to do worse than they can. Why? Is it that they feel a sense of futility? 
Is it that they perceive there's going to be no results? There's always a reason. I mean, that that's almost the, the more effective conversation when somebody goes there is there is always a reason for why somebody did that. What is that reason? Can you sympathize with that reason? Can you understand the pain behind somebody doing that? Because there's always pain behind what somebody is doing. I'm telling you, it's always about something they want and something they want to avoid. So if we have that full picture of why I feel like we don't fall down this path of needing to have those types of conversations. <laughs> I think uh, most of it comes down to people always choose what feels better yeah. in their perception. Yes. So it explains so much of the behavior that we see. If yep. you think, oh, it felt better to him than the other thing. So and can we get to the place where we could understand that place? And that's, I think this is where, where it gets really interesting for us in humanity and where I feel like movies are going to get more interesting because there's going to be less and less bad guys in movies because when you get into their perspective, you know, the perspective of these sort of bad characters as we would judge them, you really are, I'm talking abandoning your own perspective in their shoes. The question is, can you sympathize with getting to a place where it would feel better to kill someone? Can you sympathize with getting to a place where it would feel better to off yourself? Can you sympathize with being in a place where it would feel better to jam a needle in your arm? Now, if we can get to that place of understanding that, now all of a sudden we have more access to the actual solutions to these issues. We're not just standing on the outside projecting our righteous version of whatever the hell it is. You know, we have no understanding of the actual situation that a person is in. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, if we want to come back to the golden age for a minute, um, I assume the consumption of animal products, especially meat, would no longer happen in the golden yep. age. What about carnivorous animals? Would they adapt to a plant-based diet? Would they go extinct or would they just? Many would go extinct. Mm -hmm. Now, see, we assume, this is where we're going to walk down a slippery slope here because I love tigers. You love tigers. I mean, we do, who doesn't love tigers, right? Yeah. <laughs> so because of our attachment to the species, we don't want it to die. Mm -hmm. There's an expiration date on, on every species. That's something that needs to be understood. We have already judged it as wrong for something to not exist. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should celebrate the fact that the tiger is going to vanish. Like, I'll be the first person crying. But in the future, many of these, as, as source itself, it's not just humanity. As source itself goes more in the direction of a, a relationship, of symbiosis. You're going to see less and less species that are existing and being born that don't participate in symbiosis that instead are playing zero-sum games. Mm -hmm. They're still playing less of a zero-sum game than humanity, by the way. <laughs> but, but still, um, yeah, you're going to see a lot of extinctions in, as a result of this. And it's not going to just stop, by the way, with uh, animals. It's going to continue to any species that is essentially not in a state of symbiosis with another species. That means the extinction of plants, insects, all kinds of things that we're familiar with today. And we will, in the way, way off future, I'm talking, you're not going to be alive for this. Nobody is, okay? <laughs> we're talking like, woo, okay. Um, way, way, way in the future, let's say that we don't blow ourselves up completely. Uh, what you're going to see is essentially a world where there is no such thing as a non-symbiotic species. That means that the entire process of eating, of you know, consuming energy, is not dependent upon the suffering or the I'm giving up my best interests of any other species. There are certain fruit species that have developed this way already, which is why many spiritual teachers will tell you that fruit is the highest frequency thing that you can eat. And I agree with them. It's not that I, it's not that I'm looking at the biological human body and saying a fruit is the best thing you can eat for the human body. I'm not actually saying that. But what I'm saying is on a, on a metaphysical level, on a non-physical level, some of these fruit species that have figured out a symbiotic relationship with the things that want to eat them, they actually have the highest frequency. Um, and that's where you're going to see things go. So it'll be like beneficial for the plant for, you know, this specific species to be consuming some aspect of them. It's not going to be a, oh no, you know, survival of the fittest thing. I'm real excited for that potential to manifest. But I mean, what we're looking at is a world where there is no loss 
for somebody else's gain or something else's gain. Interesting. Um, by the way, we have talked about reincarnation. Is it a choice, a privilege, or a duty? And is there something like a maximum number of chances? Well, I've got a, I've got a really good question to ask you that will spell out the answer for you. You ready? Okay, so you're walking down the street and you see this like really beautiful guy. The question is, did you choose to be in a relationship with this person? If I just see him. Yeah. You choose to enter into a relationship. He's a great, great looking guy. Wonderful guy. Do you choose to be in a relationship with this person? Is that free will? Now I'm going to say yes and no. <laughs> Here's the reason why. Potentially you choose this man. Because in your childhood, you were made to annex and exile aspects of yourself. As a result of having to do that and polarizing so extremely, obviously, attraction is about polarity. Are you going to attract something exactly like you or exactly like what you just suppressed? Okay, so your attraction that you feel towards this person is a byproduct of the process of socialization that took place in your own childhood. Therefore, it was determinism, even though you technically chose into the relationship with him. So free will was acting at the same time it wasn't acting. This is true for all species when it comes to this process of reincarnation. Reincarnation is both a choice and not a choice. It is a byproduct of determinism and also choice. Wow. You surprise me with your answers. They're always even more thoughtful and deeper than I thought. <laughs> Oh, amazing. What I would about like to get out of the chain of determinism and reincarnation because <laughs> what Buddhists are talking about so much when they talk about, you know, oh, may God have mercy on your soul because you made that choice in this life. Because, I mean, there's this really famous story. I don't know if you know it, but it's a, it's a story about basically a man who is sacrificing goats. And he goes to sacrifice this one goat, goes to slit its throat, and the goat loses a single tear. And all of a sudden, this goat can talk. And he's like, why are you crying to the goat? And the goat says, because I've reincarnated as a goat 365 times or whatever, some number, you know. And he's like, um, this is my last incarnation as a goat. Before this, I was a man who sacrificed goats. I was you. So this story, basically, and, and what Buddhists are talking about so often is this purely deterministic dynamic in, in reincarnation. It's that what you're doing in this life sets the ball rolling for the next life. And that is happening. It is absolutely happening. The problem is, is that from non-physical perspective, you wouldn't disagree with it. Yeah. You'd be like, oh yeah, I'd like to see that. I mean, there's an insatiable curiosity from that non-physical perspective. The same as, I mean, you watch this in humans. I, I realize that this sort of upsets people because it definitely doesn't feel like it's a game or like it's a movie here. But a human being will willingly go into a horror film. You want me to make your life that? No, no, no. Suddenly we're like, no, no, no. I don't know. I don't want to experience that. I don't actually want somebody that's hunting me. So the pro the disconnect, honestly, between our free will, when we're sitting here looking at a juicy life experience that's going to create the expansion for ourselves on a soul-based level, my joke is that we have a little bit of a relationship like we do to horror films, you know, here as people. It's this, our perspective of time is not like this. It's, mm -hmm. that was whack, you know? Which makes us opt into things where now we're sort of stuck here in the mainframe going, you know, 20 years of hell, 30 years of hell. So <laughs> I would like I would like there to be a, a coming together of these two. I, we could say non-physical and physical perspectives because they are so dramatically different. Um, but that this is me sort of saying that your, your uh, free will, the aspect of you that has free will, quite often chooses in alignment with the deterministic aspects of your reincarnation cycle but when you develop more and more awareness of this therefore you're understanding the ripple effects you know 
you're understanding that you're connected to all things, you're understanding that every move you take creates this ripple effect across the world, then you you get more and more and more and more and more into a position of free will. And the deterministic aspect of life vanishes. And that applies not just to this life. And that's when you see you see decisions to incarnate being purely by choice. I'm talking entirely free will. There's no deterministic aspect within them. And it's extremely rare, but there have been definitely ascended masters who have been in that space. So it's not just the case that once you evolve enough that you cannot come back anymore? You could? Oh, hell yeah. You can choose back whenever you want. It's not like, do not pass go. This is a prison planet. You are no longer a vibrational man. No, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> no, in fact, this is the, that's the concept. And it's a very real concept of this bodhisattva, which is it's somebody who has escaped the deterministic cycle of reincarnation and therefore makes the conscious choice to incarnate. Will they do so for the service of the other things in, incarnated? Absolutely. Why? Because in that awakening experience, you absolutely lose this illusion of separation. There is no difference between oneself and everyone else that's now physically incarnated. So it's the most selfish thing you can do. <laughs> yeah, that's the irony behind it. Yeah. Yep. We, we do talk about very deep spiritual topics here. And I wonder if this is being wanted by source or our higher self, since we kind of like look behind the scenes all the time and we're maybe spoiling the play, the illusion of life, which is so important for earthly lessons. So is it good? Is it not so good? Because some people actually say, no, you know, this spirituality thing, it's like breaking the illusion of life. It's not supposed to be. Wow, that's a new thought. <laughs> Remember how we started off this conversation on the concept of contrast? Contrast meaning, of course, that there, there are polarities inherent in anything. Positive and negatives, negatives and positives, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's very important to understand this when it comes to this spiritual game. We can get ourselves into trouble with spirituality, big time. At the same time, am I going to sit here in front of you and say that human beings were not meant to stay connected to this other aspect? Hell no. In fact, you see a drastic change. I was just talking about this yesterday. You see a drastic change when Newton came into the picture. He, the way that this being impacted the overall perspective of humanity is so shocking. It's like the only other time you've seen entire demographics change to a whole new perspective is when brand new religions come in. He was effectively the being who disconnected humanity from non-physical. Now everything was about the physical. Everything was about a, a very clockwork, mechanical, physical world, which is much more observable. <laughs> so... Um, Before this point, people were absolutely connected. Didn't matter where they were in the world, absolutely connected to their non-physical aspects. Are people meant to forget? No, absolutely not. But that awareness is meant to enhance the commitment to the physical life. And what I'm watching, which is upsetting me now, is that so many people who are down here incarnated and who are becoming aware of this multidimensional reality and becoming aware of spirituality are like, you know what? This physical life is not great. Oh, I get it. Our point is to get out of this. So essentially they're using spirituality as, as an escape mechanism. Rather than using it to enhance and see the benefit of the physical life, it's like we're somehow in this hell construct. We're meant to remember this to get out of. And that is not true. So there's supposed to be this, let's talk about relationship again, a dynamic relationship between our awareness of what is outside of and before this, and also how that can add to and benefit our physical life, because we chose to be here in this for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. Can we bring it in rather than like, we? <laughs> <sighs> yes, makes sense. I mean, we chose to came in here. Yeah, yeah. But we have to embrace the physical. Um, and this is the thing. Humans take everything for granted. And mm -hmm. we were designed this way, by the way. We were absolutely designed this way. We're, we are expansion freaks. 
So you get something, you no longer care about wanting it. It's all about the next thing. And that's not going to change. Um, I really like that about people. Of course, inherent in it is this little shadow of, I am going to devalue anything that I experience as normal. If I could take an average person outside of the physical dimension and just have them sit there for a little bit, they would quickly remember the value of the physical dimension. And it would be my hope that people could lose themselves in that more. The feeling of putting your feet in the sand is something that non-physical beings are dying to experience. There is a, an absolute juiciness to the physical dimension, which can go one way or the other. It can either be at your absolute agony in hell or like, you know, absolute rapture. We've never designed a better construct, honestly, as source. Never designed a better construct than physicality to experience ourselves. At all levels, the worst and the best. Mm -hmm. It makes one excited to be here again. Thank you for this perspective and reminder. <laughs> um, on the other side, when we dream, we mm -hmm. do leave the physical body. Is that correct? Yes. So I'm wondering who is taking the lead when that happens and where exactly do we go and why? Well, that depends on the person, but most of the time when people are quote unquote dreaming, um, they're interacting with their own thoughts, thought forms, their own thoughtscape. So it's those things that you have created with your mind that pertain to your physical life. You're basically walking through your subconscious mind, which is why even those of us who technically don't need to dream anymore and technically could just decide to lucid dream all the time and technically could just go out of body would still opt into this unconscious dream time at, by choice because it's this juicy experience of being like, all right, what's really going on in here in my own mind? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I'm not quite understanding how we're leaving the body, but we're kind of staying in our field, right? No. So again, you're thinking the reason that you're confused is because you're thinking in terms of place. Yeah. Now, if if I say the the dream space, you are imagining a place that is somewhere, either inside you or outside you, but there there is no place. Okay. Um. So that right there is an understanding that is about the human mind creating a blockage. It's just the same as you tune a dial, bleep, different channel. <clears throat> you're engaging with that different channel. But when you're doing so, you are still leaving enough energy in the physical body here to maintain things like breathing, digestion, you know, circulation, and that type of stuff. The necessary elements to keep your body alive. Mm -hmm. So we do this to get to know ourselves better, to solve things within us? Yeah. Dream time is essentially your brain trying to process everything. Which is why I really love dream time as opposed to feeling like it's unnecessary. I, it's like a really beneficial tool, crazy beneficial tool for not only the brain to be cleaning itself. I mean, there's all kinds of biological things that happen, you know, as a part of that process. But honestly, it's like whether you're conscious of it or not, your brain is trying to work through things. It's trying to use it to expand. Wow. So your, your dreams, basically, that are positive. It's all about you experiencing what it is you're wanting. Your nightmares. It's you trying to work through problems. What's interesting is to get people to start to consciously notice these elements within their nightmares and within their dreams. Let's just talk nightmares because that's all really people care about them. When, they're, when I get people to notice what they're thinking in their dreams that are nightmares, without exception, you will realize that your own mind is trying to work through things that pertain to your waking life and you've just created all the symbology mm -hmm. to put yourself squarely in that position so i'll give you an example let's say that you've got this you've got a, a bad dream where you're trying to push the brakes and the car won't stop right um maybe you realize that this feeling that you feel is exactly the same way you feel with like your mother you know maybe you've got a mom who just is a bulldozer and does not respect boundaries and no matter what you do it feels like you can't control anything right if you watch your thoughts within that scene of trying to push the brakes, which is really about your mom, but you know, right now you symbolically made it about that car. If you watch yourself trying to push those brakes, it's like you're you're in your mind, you're trying to go around and find a way to gain your power in that situation. And 
quite often you find a way, ironically, whether it's a different way of thinking of it or, you know, I'm in an avalanche and I'm surrendering or, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Sometimes dreams can get so intense. You wake up and you don't feel like you have a restful night. You feel like, oh my goodness, can I have a break? <laughs> um, you just mentioned astral traveling. Yeah. I'm quite sure that you do that a lot. What is your favorite thing if you astral travel? I like to watch Earth. Oh. <laughs> You, you could just call me a workaholic at this point. Like I could oh. be going to these amazing places in the universe where there's all kinds of different experiences, but no, for me, it's like, I, I have to understand people more. So I love to sit and I love to watch humanity from an objective place around the world. I can literally zoom into different parts of humanity. Like I can zoom in and look at the emotional body of humanity, which is where you see the really interesting discrepancies between different cultures. Then almost like zoom in and see what, what they're creating on a, in terms of the mental aspect of humanity. Um, I watch people's patterns and I love it. Wow. Yeah. I think you once uh, told in an interview that you have projected yourself into an animal. I think it was a spider. Mm -hmm. do, can you I like that? Yeah, yeah, I do that, I do that a lot. Yeah, I do that a lot. That's like a lot, a lot, yeah. <laughs> wow. You must <laughs> have an exciting life. <laughs> Yeah. Let's just say there's never any boredom. Yeah. Even it's a lot to process, probably a lot, a lot. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot, and it creates different problems for than than would be problems for the average person. Yeah. Like I've got I've got different nightmares than the average person. My mm -hmm. my nightmares are about parallel perceptual realities. If you specialize in, in getting rid of your perspective to the degree that you can become another species and then another species and then another species, or even let's just talk about one person versus another person, your nightmares start to become about the gaps in perception of reality. Knowing that the wellness of each of these species is dependent on the other one getting it. The gap between that perception is the scariest thing on earth to me. <laughs> Crazy and very hard to imagine. Yeah. Wow. Um, one of your gifts includes that you can see potential timelines. And I can imagine this to be very overwhelming when it comes to the collective consciousness, let alone your personal life. Can mm -hmm. you give us an example of how that can look like in your personal relationships and how do you deal with it? Oh, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Honestly, no matter how much somebody would sit down with me and say, this is so amazing, you can see this because I can. It doesn't matter. Because what I've noticed is that when I, when I make people around me, this world isn't just about me. When I make people around me aware of these things that they're headed towards and things that will happen, they still don't change. Mm -hmm. So what I have is the distinct pleasure of watching a train wreck that's going to happen, warning everybody that it's going to happen, and it always happens. So, on to, you know, with the exception of preparing myself emotionally for it happening, there's like very little, honestly, that I've been able to do. It hasn't stopped me from still having these types of conversations. But, I mean, it's, you, it, you really, I mean, honestly, in my teen years, this was, this was part of why I wanted to kill myself. It was because... Like, what is the point of seeing that something's going to happen if you can't do anything to prevent that thing? And it's not even that you can't. It's that in a consensus reality, there is no guarantee that people will participate or not. It's also a very special hell when you're in a relationship with someone and you see the first life path potential where another person is in that life with them. And you know that you're headed down a road in that relationship towards not being with that person anymore. And that, that always happens. It happens in every relationship. So. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, but then I can't. Then, then you're in a position like I'm in a position where I can't say to that person, oh, well, you know, this is going so bad. Like, I just need to protect myself at this point because there's another girl in your life path potentials. I can't do it. Instead, it has to be a. I usually keep it to myself. 
I usually try to understand what it is that this person is getting out of that future relationship that they were not getting with me. I start to get ahead of it. I, you know, start to plan around it. And quite often I run into a situation where my own best interests and like doing what I need in some boundary that I have is an oppositional force to whatever it is that they're needing. And then I understand why. But then it's like, as the relationship deteriorates, it's like one life path will pop up with this new, new person. Then a second one, then a third one. By that point, it's over. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the potential for that is, is there for everyone. It's just that you can see it. I mean, maybe that's some uplifting thought. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Yeah. Because what I've needed and what people in my position need is, is for other people to get on board with it when it happens. You know, what we're needing is people to be like, wait, wait, wait. This is a genuine thing that is being seen. It's not woo-woo. Okay, what do we do to plan around that or to plan for it or to plan against it? It's, you know, but there is no, there is nobody I've met yet that's able to do that. And yeah. Well, you know what I find interest, most interesting about this? I don't know if you've ever seen Minority Report, but I feel like Minority Report puts this into perspective in a way that I don't think any other film has, honestly, where there's this scene and it was Tom Cruise basically is is playing this police guy. And there are these precogs. So at this point, they're using psychics to determine crimes. And when a, when crimes basically are about to happen, the name of the person who commits the offense is basically etched into this ball. So we it starts off with this guy who's you know going and hunting people down before they commit crimes, mm -hmm. and there's a scene where basically the ball rolls down and it's his own name, right? So he's looking at this his name. And he's like, there is no way, there is no way I've been framed. There is no way I would commit this crime. But then you know it, it, later in the movie he ends up in a scene where basically his son it turns out his son was kidnapped right and and all of a sudden he's in a hotel room with these pictures of his son cut out and it becomes obvious that he's standing in the room of the person who killed his son and at that minute he's like i am going to kill this person mm -hmm. and what i've noticed even when i involve people who are open to the fact that i see these things we reach that point often where they say Oh my gosh, I didn't think I was going to choose that. I thought you were literally telling me this. And I was like, there's no way. And now standing here in this position today, I can see exactly why I'm going to choose it. And I am. <laughs> so yeah, you're stepping in a little bit into my pain here with this, this, this particular question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why my admiration for you as a being is so huge because I see all of these things too. And I think about them. And I think most people, they just see your title and not the humanity behind it, let alone the gifts that you have that also have, you know, challenges. So yeah, massive respect. Teal, uh, since you can see energies and frequencies in people, are there any foods, crystals, oils, anything that um, especially raises the frequency in a person or like their consciousness, something that would apply to everyone. Avocados. Really? <laughs> um, what else? Really good sources of water from, from specific places in the world. Like almost everybody would benefit by Hawaiian water. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Blue lotus oil. Oh, yeah, I've been wanting to get one for my birthday. People, people actually, right now, especially, like people definitely would benefit by that frequency right now. Specifically the blue. There's many different types of lotuses, but the blue lotus is the one that's very impressive to me. Um, what else? God, there's so many. This is kind of a good idea that you gave me. Maybe writing down a whole list. Oh, yes, please. Berries. Many berries. I don't know. This is hard to come up with off the top of my head. I feel like if I sat down and thought about it, I could definitely come up with a really comprehensive list. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait on that. Um, but on the other hand, what kind of things or activities, foods will decrease a person's vibration drastically? 
processed foods, obviously. I mean, the less alive that a food is, the worse it is for a person. Um, food that 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 comes with a great deal of suffering is not something that a person should be putting in their mouth. You know, for, for many of us, we want to take that as far as, you know, we're not going to eat animals because the central nervous system makes it so that the experience in in death and in even life for many of them is so much suffering that you don't want to put that near your mouth. Um, but even when, you know, those of us who have chosen to take steps like that, it's about not eating vegetables that are suffering. And I mean, I know that that makes people kind of balk at that, but plants can suffer the way that they are raised matters. Mm -hmm. The way that they're handled matters. The more conscious you become, the more sensitive you get to this. It gets to the point where it's very difficult to go out to eat. Mm -hmm. um, you can really only eat out at places that already understand this. <laughs> I would definitely say that spending a hell of a lot of time near electrical equipment is not something which should be done. You know, and I, I actually thought to say this in the very beginning of our talk, but I'm saying it now, even when it comes to technology, we really haven't created technology that's really good for us yet. Mm -hmm. That's a potential for the future. But the, but the fact that technology is not really good for us right now and that there are a lot of elements that go into it, whether it's metals or whether it's electric currents or things like that that are not actually beneficial for the, the human being, we need to be taking breaks at the very least. So you mentioned taking a walk with no cell phone, right? This is brilliant for people to be doing this, to continue to get out into nature, to be walking barefoot. That's something that I highly suggest people do, to like leave their phone in the car, take their shoes off and go walk barefoot in a place that is truly natural. Um, sleep. We can't, we can't mess with sleep. We don't have the luxury of messing with sleep, quite frankly. So the better that we can get our sleep cycles, the better when it comes to health. Um, I recently found these grounding sheets, which somebody introduced me to, which I think are absolutely brilliant. And I can tell you as an extrasensory, it matters whether they're plugged in or not. Wow. So I wish everyone would get one of those. <laughs> you mean these sheets that you plug into earth and then they go onto your bed? Okay. I wasn't sure if they, if they work. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure either until someone gave me a Christmas present. And I was, I uh, kid you not, plugged it in and was like, whoa. And then it's happened so many times where I have a terrible night and I wake up, I'm like, oh, I just feel crappy. And then like I look and it's not plugged in. I can now tell whether it's plugged in or not, 100%. I can see it. I mean, it's, they're amazing. Like I can't, I can't tell you how amazing. Okay, wow. Yeah. So I wish people were doing that. Um, what else in terms of health? People really need to be with themselves emotionally, like tapping back into emotional intelligence, which is that every emotion is essentially a carrier of a personal truth. We're not living according to those personal truths if we're tuned out relative to our emotions. So these time periods where people are checking in with themselves, like what if, and I, I love watching movies, don't get me wrong, I love them. But like, what if instead of watching that sort of sitcom show that you're about to watch, what if you just went into a room and sat down and just put a timer on? You don't have to do it forever. 20 minutes where you're really turning all of your attention to you inside. How am I feeling? Where, where am I feeling this thing in my body? What thoughts are associated with this sensation? It's like a check-in, you know, with ourself. People would experience a lot more health if they were doing things like that. I could probably go on and on also with a list like this, but you kind of get the picture. Yes. And maybe my last question regarding your nutrition, uh, I know that you are eating a very healthy diet, yet strict, you know, no caffeine, no alcohol, no animal products. No, no. I am not fun to go out with. I My diet is so extreme that it's, I'm like having an exotic pet. It's just not fun. <laughs> I, one, but yeah, I have a very, very extreme diet. I, I have to in order to maintain the level of pressure that I'm under and to maintain the level of purity and clarity. It is not an option for me to get out of alignment in the position that I'm in. So 
I have to basically take every measure to do that. That means that I can't cut corners where other people can cut corners. So essentially my everyday diet is more similar to what most people would be eating during a cleanse. Do you want um, specifics? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I eat a totally lectin-free diet. This was my point. I totally. find everything plausible, but when I heard lectin-free, I'm like, why? <laughs> okay, so so here, I'm gonna, let me pitch this to you. So if, essentially, lectins are compounds that are created by plants specifically to combat an animal. Now, it's basically their war. Right. And we, we look at plants like these innocent beings that are just wonderful and just want to be eaten. But that is not the picture of plants at all. Right. Um, plants have been essentially creating a warfare dynamic with animals for centuries by developing, you know, things that will upset your tummy so you don't eat it. And 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 mm -hmm. so lectins are essentially compounds created by plants as as an as like an a, a self defense mechanism against animals and some people obviously have developed the capacity to like eh, i can eat this kind of and it's like maybe my health deteriorates over years but whatever some people are crazy sensitive to them i am very sensitive like canary level sensitive to these to these plant compounds um most people by the way who have gluten sensitivities are sensitive to all lectins because gluten is only one lectin um so there are certain plants that have high levels of these. Now you can imagine that a plant wants to preserve it, wants to like preserve its seeds and wants to preserve its young. So there's high degrees of concentration in certain seeds, for example, because the plants wanted to wanting you to not eat that. Mm -hmm. So so what I'm doing is eating a diet where when the plant essentially is saying, I don't want you to eat me, I'm like, okay, I'm not eating you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also like sensitive. I'm it's not just about lectins. It's like I'm also sensitive to like seriously high levels of sugar in things that have been bred to a point where you shouldn't eat them. Like bananas are a good example. I don't eat bananas. Why do I not eat bananas? Because the banana that you know today is a, a modified object that never existed in an actual reality. Like chimps shouldn't be eating them. No, no, no species in the ape kingdom, honestly, should be eating that. Too much sugar. And this is what people aren't getting. We're looking at the foods we're eating today with this perspective of, oh, it's just, it's there. It must be natural. No, actually, what you're eating is the byproduct of centuries of companies basically designing that product so you will eat it. Not Makes that you want to go live on an island again. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't do coffee. I don't do any alcohols. I don't do any, <laughs> no, no like refined sugars. It's special. <laughs> well, it, it's getting more and more uh, normal for many people. Good. Let's hope that it continues there. Because the first time that they open a, a lectin-free vegan restaurant, I will be there every day. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. Teal, I could talk to you for hours, if not months, about all kinds of topics in this world and outside of it. And maybe if this interview gets enough positive response... There might be a second part, who knows? So if you as a viewer like it and think it's valuable, please like and share and yeah, comment on it. Um, from my side, before I end this interview, I would like to give you the chance to say something if you want to add something to it. I mean, I should have thought of this before. Um, I want to say something. You know, actually, interestingly enough, what I think I want to say right now is that if I had my wish, more people right now would be focusing on ancestral healing. Um, I see that as a very important thing for people to be doing right now. And I know that when I say that word ancestral healing, it be, people feel very abstract about it. It's like, well, how do I go do that? Like, mm -hmm. um, I do want to promise the people who are watching this, I have just created, I have created a, a new um, course, in fact, that's designed to help people to get to the nitty gritty of ancestral healing. But the reason that I created that course right now, which is why I don't care whether you go down my path or anybody else's path relative to ancestral healing. The reason I created that course is because it's so critical for us right now. Like this generation right now is carrying so many of the wounds of the past generations and those wounds in fact are lining us up with some very dangerous things most especially uh potential war so if i had my vote it would be that all of us right now we're like okay okay it's time we're all doing ancestral healing like mass ancestral healing across the globe 
so yeah, that's what I would want to say. If anybody's watching this and, and this sort of like, well, I don't know where to focus my time. That would be my hope is that you would focus your time on ancestral healing because you cannot imagine the box that that opens, not just for refusing to carry on these transgenerational wounding patterns, but also in terms of your own personal identity. And we're in a we're in a time right now where it's never been more important, honestly, not only to let go of these painful and um, detrimental ancestral patterns, but also each one of us needs to own the medicine of our ancestry very powerfully right now and bring that to the table for each other, especially in our state of such extreme division. Wow, that is some really, really great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you on behalf of humanity for your existence. <laughs> the world would be missing something great without you. I hope you are aware of that. And this is not only how I feel, so do tens of thousands of other people. Um, thank you for being this gift that keeps on giving. And thank you for making my little dream come true today. We have finally met on a physical plane. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you so much.